Hello, welcome back. So here we are with chapter two, where we're going to get into some chemistry. So this should be kind of a um, review if you guys took chemistry in high school or are currently taking chemistry. And we're gonna look at how chemistry and biology are very closely related, especially when we're talking about the formation of life. So we're gonna look at like atoms and how they're connected to each other, structures of atoms and ions, uh, chemical reactions. And then we're gonna end on properties of water and when you're bringing chemicals together. So first of all, chemical evolution is going to be uh, right now the current leading explanation for the origin of life on Earth, which is basically saying that it took non-living things, substances, chemicals, to come together to provide the necessary ingredients for life to occur. So you're getting energy coming from carbon-containing molecules coming together, and then those molecules bond together and then eventually get to the point where they can replicate or make copies of themselves. And then that chemical evolution led into biological evolution. So once that happened, natural selection came in and took over and evolution just took off from there. And then you start seeing all these organisms coming to life. So here's a video that better explains this whole entire process. And I really like this video. And if you need to pause it and come back to it, I highly suggest it's got a lot of really good uh, information. Stated Clearly presents, what is chemical evolution? Scientists have reason to think that the first living cells on Earth came about through a natural process called chemical evolution. What is chemical evolution? How does it work? And how is it different from biological evolution? To answer these questions, we'll start by first dissecting the terms and then look at an example of how chemical evolution can take simple molecules and organize them into complex structured systems similar to those found in living cells. The word evolution simply means change over time. Biological evolution deals with changes in things which are able to reproduce. Living creatures make copies of themselves. The change over time that we see in biological evolution is not just random change. Oftentimes, it is adaptive change. Populations become better able to survive and reproduce within their environments. When conditions are right, Biological evolution can even drive a species to develop brand new characteristics and abilities. For this to happen, biological evolution typically requires three conditions. Reproduction, variation, and selection. Let's see how this works. Many species of holly have smooth edged leaves. English holly, however, is covered in spikes which protect the plant from deadly predators. How did these weapons first evolve? Well, when a holly plant reproduces, its offspring often show random variation. They are slightly different from their parents and slightly different from each other. In a forest filled with grazing animals, individual plants which happen to be harder to eat than their siblings are more likely to grow up and have children of their own. Nature, simply by being difficult to survive in, selects who gets to reproduce and pass on their new traits, and who does not. In this case, mutations which simply caused the veins of these leaves to extend past their edges gave rise to a brand new weapon. The discovery of biological evolution was an incredible breakthrough in science. It explained how new complex traits and abilities develop naturally in living things. The problem is, Biological evolution depends on reproduction in order to work. Reproduction, however, is an extremely complex process in and of itself. This begs the question, how did reproduction first evolve? To try and solve this mystery, many scientists are looking into chemical evolution. Chemical evolution refers to changes in things that need not be capable of reproduction. Examples could be individual molecules, or entire chemical systems. A chemical system is a group of molecules that interact with each other. Molecules, structures, and chemical systems almost always evolve or change over time 
but they often evolve towards simplicity. Solid iron corrodes into rust when it comes in contact with the water. Proteins break down when exposed to too much heat. If simple chemistry is to give rise to something advanced enough to reproduce, there must be situations in which chemical systems can grow in complexity, form new structures, and gain new functions. In order for this to happen, reproduction, which is needed in biological evolution, can be replaced with a much simpler process, repetitive production. On planet Earth and all throughout the universe, Powerful natural events take place in regular cycles. The heating and then the cooling of day and night. The repetitive eruptions of volcanic geysers. The rise and then the fall of ocean tides. These events repetitively produce or give birth to new molecules and chemical systems. These products increase over time and often develop new abilities as they interact with their environment. Let's see an example of how this process works. This here is a special molecule called a fatty acid. It's a collection of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and oxygen atoms, all stuck together in a specific pattern. Fatty acids are one of many complex molecules that living cells use inside their bodies. They build fatty acids with atoms they get from their environment. Scientists used to think that living cells were the only things able to consistently build fatty acids, but check this out. Lab experiments have shown that if simple common gases, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, are heated up with minerals like those found in the Earth's crust, a variety of complex carbon molecules, including fatty acids, begin to grow. Living cells are not needed. This can happen naturally in underground chambers heated by the Earth's magma. As pressure builds, these molecules can belch up into pools of water where a simplified version of natural selection then takes over. Most particles blasted into water will either float or they will sink. Nature selects against them staying in the watery environment. Fatty acids, however, remain suspended in warm water growing in number as the cycle repeats. When fatty acid concentrations are high enough, they bunch together, automatically self-assembling into a stable ball. This happens because water molecules are attracted to the oxygen heads of fatty acids, sort of like a magnet, but water repels their oily carbon tails. When fatty acids pass near each other, their tails are pushed together by water, eventually forming a ball. As fatty acid collections continue to increase, they join together to make large skins. If fluctuations in these skins happen to make the edges touch, water forces those edges to fuse together. The end result is a stable hollow container similar to the membrane or skin of a living cell. These containers have a brand new ability. They can trap other molecules inside, acting as an entirely new environment for chemical evolution to continue working within. It's important to note that these membranes do not qualify as living creatures. They can't reproduce on their own the same way living cells do. That said, the development of these membranes, along with many other molecules and chemical systems that scientists have observed, demonstrate an extremely important principle. Chemical evolution can give rise to new characteristics and abilities. Because of this, scientists hypothesize that under the right circumstances, chemical evolution could give rise to systems that are fully capable of reproduction. If they are correct, this would bridge the gap between chemical evolution and biological evolution, demonstrating that chemistry can indeed give rise to life. Scientists at the Center for Chemical Evolution and other research groups around the globe are working hard to test this hypothesis. So, to sum things up, the main difference between chemical evolution and biological evolution is that chemical evolution can produce new characteristics and abilities without depending on reproduction. Because of this, chemical evolution is being investigated as a possible cause for the origin of life.
I'm John Perry, and that's chemical evolution stated clearly. <clears throat> okay, so I really like that video because it really goes through the basics of chemistry and these different molecules and chemicals and how they came together. And I really like the culmination there where it's showing the phospholipids or the fatty acid chains, which we'll talk about later, but how they come together and make this little ball. And that ball really looks like a precursor to a cell, like an animal cell or a plant cell that eventually, you know, it's going to become life. So is this a plausible theory? And so what is the evidence? So that's where we're going to really get into chemistry here. So first of all, there's four main types of atoms that make up 96% of all living organisms. And I like to call them CHON, C-H-O-N. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So those four chemicals, 96% of our living body is made up of just those four chemicals, CHON. And so we're going to look at the basic physical structure of these four chemicals and see how those four chemicals actually can be put together to make up 96% of our body. So first of all, some basic chemistry here. Atoms are composed of three components, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So protons are the positively charged particles. And the way I remember this proton, pro usually means positive, like you're for something. So pro is positive. Neutrons are considered neutral, so they do not carry a charge. So I'm going to put a little note here. Protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral, so new, neutral, have no charge. And then electrons are considered negative. And so those are your negatively charged particles. So protons and neutrons are actually found inside the nucleus, whereas ne electrons are found in the orbitals around it. So let's say this is a nucleus of, a, of, a, of an atom, and you've got your protons and your neutrons on the inside. The electrons would actually be in an orbital around it. Okay? So here's another way of looking at it. So you've got your... Uh, simple uh, diagram of a hydrogen atom on the left with its one single proton here in the middle with the positive side and then it's one electron and then you have carbon which actually has one two three four five six electrons and on the inside it also has six protons and six neutrons um, this diagram here on the right that's showing this arena it's saying that if an atom occupy the same volume as this entire stadium, the nucleus would be about the size of a pea. So if you can imagine on this entire stadium, one little tiny little pea in the center of that would be like the size of a nucleus compared to its whole uh, space of this atom. So basically an atom is predominantly empty space, okay? It's got the little protons and neutrons in the center and the electrons on the outside, but it's, it's such a tiny, particle but with so much space between the particles it's it's very fascinating okay so when you're looking at a periodic table which i know you guys have all seen before on that periodic table of elements it's got all the elements on there and then it's got an information chart or section for each one of those chemicals the first number you're going to see on there is actually called an atomic number, and that's going to be the number of protons in the nucleus of that atom. So, for example, carbon has six protons. It's always written as a superscript at the top of the symbol, and the symbol, like this C right here, stands for carbon in this case. Uh, some of the periodic tables will actually have the name at the bottom, and some of them don't. Some of them are very abbreviated, and it'll just have the symbols. So you kind of really have to know what each of those belong, what each of those stand for. Atoms of the same uh, atomic number have the same chemical properties and become an element. So, for example, there is the carbon element, and the carbon element is the only one that has just six protons. Okay, so here's your periodic table, and you can see... Uh, many of the other elements here, here's carbon that we just looked at. And again, at the top, it's got the atomic number. So it's telling you how many protons are found in each one of these. 
Also, the proton number is the same as the electron number as well. So if it's got six protons, it's got six electrons too. Some other information on here, you've got your atomic mass number at the bottom, which will tell you when you combine the protons and the neutrons, what the mass would actually be of uh, the total interior of the nucleus. So protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. So what happens when you put a positive and a negative together? You get neutral. Okay, they balance each other out. So that's what's pretty cool about a way an atom works is you've got the positive in the middle and the negative orbiting around it because positives and negatives are attracted to each other. Just like you say, opposites attract. These two are attracted to each other, but when they become together, they become neutral. The mass number, like I had mentioned, if you looked at the bottom of the symbol, is the number that's down here, which is, you know, one, it's usually a decimal of some sort. The mass number is telling you the number of protons plus neutrons in an atom, and it's written typically as a subscript at the bottom of the symbol. symbol. Each proton and each neutron has a mass of one Dalton, so that would be a unit of measurement for the mass. And the mass of an electron is so small, it's not even considered. It's typically ignored. So the mass of an atom is equal to the mass number, which again is the protons plus the neutrons. Okay. We have isotopes, which is another term that's important. Isotopes are going to be forms of an element with different numbers of neutrons. So isotopes of an element will actually have different masses. So for example, there are isotopes of carbon. All carbons have six protons. However, their neutrons vary based on the type of isotope. So there's carbon-12, which has six neutrons, and therefore six plus six, because it's going to be protons plus neutrons, in this case would equal 12, because if you have six neutrons and six protons, you're going to get 12 for the atomic mass. Carbon-13 is 7 neutrons plus 6 protons, gives you 13. And then carbon-14 has 8 neutrons plus, again, the 6 equals 14. So there's various elements that have different isotopes. Carbon is probably the most uh, popular one and most common, and we use it a lot in biology when we're dating an organism or a fossil to see how old it is. So you may have heard of carbon dating, and that's actually using isotopes of carbon. The atomic weight of an element is the average of all of its masses that are naturally occurring, including its isotopes. So the example of the atomic mass of carbon would be 12.01 because Carbon-12 is actually the most abundant isotope in this case. So there is also carbon-13 and carbon-14, but carbon-12 is the most common. And so you're going to see the mass being closer to 12. Most isotopes are stable, but some are unstable, and those are considered radioactive isotopes, which decay over time. And so carbon would actually be an example of that. So you can actually measure the amount of carbon-14 that is left in a fossil, and that will give you the date or age of that fossil. And we'll actually, you'll hear more about radioactive isotopes later on, uh, specifically in Biology 1307 when we get into evolution, when it's really specifically brought up. Okay, so electrons, we know, move around the nuclei of a, or of an atom and things called orbitals, okay? So let's say that this was my nucleus and I have my little, my little um, protons and neutrons in here. On the outside, that's where my electrons would be. So these little guys here are orbiting around it, okay? So each orbital can only hold up to two electrons, okay, that's key, only two. And orbitals can be grouped into levels called electron shells. And those shells are numbered starting uh, the one closest to the nucleus would be number one, then two, three, and so forth. The numbers indicate their distance away from the nucleus and smaller numbers are closer to the nucleus. So again, this right here would be my first orbital. This would be my second orbital. If I had a third, this would be my third and so forth. 
Each electron shell contains a specific number of orbitals. So there could be one, uh, the very first one would only hold two. So an electron shell can only hold two. But if you have a shell that actually has four orbitals, each one of those would carry two, so for a total of eight. And the electrons of the atom will fill the innermost shells first and then the outermost. So in other words, if you have a nucleus again here, there's a little protons and neutrons, the very first orbital, it's going to fill up with those two electrons first. If there are more, they will go to the second orbital. And it's going to continue that way until it gets all the electrons filled up. The outermost shell of an atom is considered its valence shell, and this is where your valence electrons are. So outermost and valence are synonymous here, okay? The outermost shell are the outermost electrons. The number of unpaired valence electrons is also called the valence of an atom, okay? So different atoms have different numbers of unpaired electrons. So it may have one unpaired electron, it may have seven unpaired electrons. And it's just telling you that's how many electrons are by themselves. So here's a very simplified periodic table that's only focusing on these, these uh, first set of elements on the periodic table. So you've got hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and so forth. When you're looking at this picture, this particular periodic table, it's showing you what the orbitals look like in the nucleus. So for example, here on hydrogen, you can see you've got the nucleus, which has the one proton in it and the one electron in its shell. If you look at helium, it's got its one, uh, its individual little uh, nucleus here with the first electron shell only containing two electrons. And if you jump down here to argon, this one has one, two, three electron shells. The first one only has two, again, because that's always true for every one of these. The first one can only hold two. So if you look at all of these guys here, they can only hold two. When you jump up to the second orbital, it can hold eight. So this one's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus the original two, so that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So argon is actually number 18 on the periodic table, and it's got 18 electrons. Also has 18 protons, but we don't typically draw what's in the nucleus because it's so tiny, and you kind of run out of space, honestly, so you don't really need to draw those. But this is what you would see for um, the orbital set up for argon. And it's got eight on the second uh, shell and eight on the third shell, okay, and two on the first for a total of 18. Okay, so atoms are most stable when their valence shells are full, which means they're satisfied. They have all their electrons, have found a partner, their entire uh, set of orbitals are filled, and they're very stable and happy. When they are not stable and they don't have their uh, shells full, that's when they decide to start making chemical bonds. When they get chemical bonds, this is when they will get to share or donate or accept electrons. So they're attracted to atoms that have a similar problem. So for example, sodium has this one little extra electron just kind of hanging out all by itself. Chlorine has seven and would love to take that one extra electron from sodium, and so it does. So you get sodium chloride, which is salt, table salt, because they have a nice little relationship where they can take one electron from one little guy and the seven of the other and put them together and they get a nice eight and they fill up their um, valence shell. So covalent bonding is going to form when unpaired valence electrons are shared by the two atoms, giving them a full outer shell. So for hydrogen, hydrogen in nature does not like to be by itself. This little guy here does not want to be by himself because he's got one little electron all alone. They don't like that. They like to have their electrons paired. So in nature, they will find another hydrogen that has the same problem and then share them. 
So right here, you've got a covalent bond where these two hydrogens have now become H2 because they're sharing those electrons. And now they're both happy. When you get this happening, molecules are going to be held together with a covalent bond and become compounds. So a compound is going to be whenever a molecule gets uh, joining together different elements. Okay, so H2 could be a compound. You're getting two of them. H2O would be a compound. Na. Uh, Cl, sodium chloride, would be a compound. Uh, another interesting thing about the periodic table is it is also showing you an idea about electronegativity. So what is electronegativity? This is saying that not all electrons are shared equally. Um, atoms have different electronegativity, which means the strength at which they pull their electrons toward themselves. And it's determined by the number of protons and the distance from the valence shell from the nucleus. So if you're looking at a periodic table, it goes up, going to the right, and going up. I'm sorry. So going to the right and going up, you have higher electronegativity. So when you're looking at, um, for example, this list of elements right here, Oxygen would be on the far left. So let's see where oxygen is. Here's oxygen. Okay. And then there's nitrogen. So nitrogen is next to it right here. And then you've got sulfur down here and carbon and then hydrogen and phosphorus. So on here, the highest, most electronegative element would be the oxygen because it is closest to the top and closest to the right. So oxygen is the most electronegative of this particular list of elements. Okay, that difference in electronegativity can tell you how many electrons are distributed in the bonds. And you have two different types of bonds that can form. You can have a nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. The nonpolar ones are evenly shared between the two atoms. They are symmetrical and they are very balanced looking. So an example would be carbon, <coughs> excuse me, plus hydrogen, <coughs> excuse me. So if we drew a picture of this, we would say here's carbon, here's hydrogen, here's another hydrogen, because it's actually gonna take four hydrogens to satisfy that carbon's need for electrons and hydrogens only have one electron to share. So you're actually going to see the four carbons that, excuse me, the four electrons that carbon needs to take care of handled by four hydrogens. It ends up looking very symmetrical, very balanced, and they're all evenly shared. That would be a non-polar covalent bond. If you are looking at a polar covalent bond, the electrons get shared unevenly. And an example of that would be uh, when oxygen and hydrogens come together, so H2O. So you'll have an oxygen and two hydrogens wanting to work together here, but it's not evenly shared, where actually this oxygen has got its own little set of electrons sitting here, kind of creating this unbalanced bent look. So it looks bent. Whereas on a nonpolar molecule, it's very balanced. This one's very bent, and there's an unsharing, uh, unevenly sharing of electrons. So in this case, oxygen is like a hog. He's taking the electrons and pulling them toward himself and making him very bent and uneven. So here's a, another diagram. So this would be an example of a nonpolar one. The two hydrogens are sharing equally. And then your polar bond, which is water, is unequal. And again, oxygen is, is kind of like the hog that's taking the electrons and bending the structure. When an atom uh, and a molecule has high electronegativity, it's going to hold the electrons more tightly and create a partial negative charge, and the other atom will have a positive charge. So water has a part that is 
negative, which would be where the oxygen is, and then the hydrogen end would be considered more positive. Okay, and so that's where the idea of polar comes from. Because if you think of like North Pole and South Pole, they are opposites of each other. And that's what's happening here. You've got a negative end and a positive end. So it's polar, polar opposites. Okay, and then so there's different types of bonding as well. So we have the covalent where they're sharing. And now we've got an ionic bond which is going to result when electrons actually get transferred from one atom to another to give both atoms full shells. So an ion is an atom that carries a charge, and there's two types. There's cation and anion. Okay, a cation actually loses an electron and becomes positive. An anion gains an electron and becomes negative. So how can we remember that? Okay, how can we remember that, and I'm going to change my pen here for a second. How can we remember that a cation is positive, yet a anion is actually considered negative? Okay, so I have my own little device that I like to use to remember how this works. And I've always done the idea that cats are positive because I like cats. <laughs> if you don't like cats, sorry, this may not work for you, but I like cats, so cats are positive, okay? But I used to have a friend and her name was Anne and she was very negative Nancy. So Anne was negative, okay? So if you know of any Anne's or Anna and they're kind of negative, they're the negative ones. <laughs> And cations are the positive ones. Okay. I suggest you guys come up with mnemonic devices that work best for you. Um, this is what I use, but if you can use make up your own, it always makes biology a little easier because there's a lot of terminology here. So anyway, so a cation is positive because it's going to lose an electron and become positive. And you're probably thinking, well, if you lose something, isn't that negative? Well, not if the thing you're losing is negative because electrons are negative, okay? So if you lose something that's negative, that makes you positive, okay? An anion, on the other hand, is going to gain an electron, which is negative. And if you gain something that's negative, that makes you negative, okay? Now, ionic bonds are going to form between both of these. So anions and cations come together and they form an ionic bond. So an example of this would be sodium chloride or table salt. So in this case, we've got sodium and chlorine, okay? Sodium, let's look at its valence shell. So the last orbital has got one little lonely electron all by itself. If we look at chlorine or chloride, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It has seven in its outer shell. So this guy's got one, this guy's got seven. So let me label them here. Okay, seven is not a nice balanced number. It's not even, but neither is one. But when you put seven plus one together, you get eight. And eight is actually a very nice number when it comes to chemistry. And then the idea is if you put these guys here together, so if this electron jumps over here and is added to these sets of electrons, you'll get a complete outer shell for the chlorine, and then you end up with a very balanced molecule. So sodium and chloride do this in nature. Your chlorides and your sodiums come together and they form table salt, okay, which is what we put in our food. So this is an example of an ionic bond where you had your cation, which would be the sodium, donating an electron and becoming positive, and your cation, anion, excuse me, being negative, accepting that and becoming more negative, and so this would be your anion. Sorry, my handwriting's not great. Oops. Okay. Take my menu off here so I can see. 
So now we've got simple molecules getting formed whenever you take those four elements that are crucial for life. Okay, Chon, C-H-O-N. So whenever you've got uh, carbons and hydrogens and nitrogens and oxygens, they're going to want to come together. And when they do that, they actually have some options. Some of them could be por uh, creating single bonds, which is what we've seen so far, or they could actually create double and triple bonds. Okay, so we're going to look at examples of those. So in this case, single bonds would be like water, where you have a single bonding here, um, ammonia, which is nitrogen plus three hydrogens, those are single bonds, and methane, which is carbon with four hydrogens, so those are all single bonds. If we had a double bond, it would look something like this. Carbon dioxide creates a double bond with carbon in the middle and two oxygens creating two double bonds on the side. <clears throat> and then there's actual triple bonds. So nitrogen would pair up with itself with another nitrogen, and it's actually going to be sharing three sets of electrons and therefore becoming a triple bond. So you'll see some of these uh, happening as well, okay? So a molecule shape actually also indicates how it's going to act. So it tells you its behavior. So for example, N2 with its triple bond, and carbon dioxide with its double bond, those are linear. So when you draw them, they go straight across. Oops, sorry, I did that one backwards. Let me, let me fix that. Okay, I'm gonna redraw that, pardon me. So nitrogen, is going to triple bond with another nitrogen and become linear. Carbon will double bond with two oxygens and it is also considered linear, okay? Methane, on the other hand, is a tetrahedron because the electrons are actually gonna be pulled away from each other. So in that case, you'll have your carbon in the middle and then your hydrogens all lined up around it, kind of in a little cross formation or a tetrahedron. Formation. And then water is planar or bent. So in this case, you have your oxygen and your hydrogens, and it's got this bent shape to it. Okay. So this is another way of looking at um, how these molecules look. So you've got your methane with your CH4 and your water, and the way they would look if you were building a molecule of it. So now, when you're representing molecules, if you are building them, you could build them like in the prior picture, or if you're writing them out, there's different ways of writing them. So there's a molecular formula, where you actually write out the number and types of atoms in a molecule. So for example, H2O and CH4. It's telling you there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. It's telling you there's one carbon and four hydrogens. Okay, so that's the molecular formula. If you want to do a structural formula, this is going to indicate which atoms are actually stuck together and whether they're double, single, or triple bond. So a structural formula is a little more specific. So for example, N2 would be nitrogen triple bonded. So it's kind of giving you a little bit more information. And then you've got a ball and stick model or a space filling model and this is where we're actually showing three-dimensional geometry. So they'll show you the model and you can see it. Okay, so here's your list of examples. So your molecular formulas would just be, you know, basically just writing the letters with the number next to it to indicate how many of those symbols. Structural formula would be drawing it out and showing you single bonds or double bonds. Ball and stick models would be literally building a model with balls and sticks. And in laboratory settings, when we're in person, we would normally build these. Virtually, uh, one of the labs you guys will do, you'll kind of build one virtually. And then space filling model is actually showing you which elements take up the most space. So if you're looking at methane, carbon, this black molecule, is making taking up the most space because it's the larger of the molecules there. So hydrogen's a little bit smaller and then the carbon's bigger. Same thing with ammonia. 
Nitrogen is bigger than hydrogen, so it's taking up more space. In water, oxygen is bigger than hydrogen, it takes up more space. And carbon dioxide, they're almost kind of balanced. Okay, chemical evolution that we've been kind of talking about here is the idea, again, that life came from chemicals, right? Everything had to be perfectly set up with chemicals. So likely this occurred in an aqueous or water-based environment, so like the ocean. Okay, so life is based on water because water is an excellent solvent, which means that it dissolves other substances. Okay, so water is a solvent, and it dissolves stuff. And then you have a solute, and a solute is the stuff that gets dissolved. So think of solute like salt, for example, or sugar, okay? Those are substances that get dissolved by a solvent, in this case, water. So we know that water is polar, okay? And the oxygen atoms are, have that partial negative charge. The hydrogen has a partial positive charge, and the charges are opposite ends. Because of this, it makes water uh, have that bent shape and also allows it to interact and stack better with other water molecules. So the partial negative charge on the oxygen of one will attract to the partial positive charge of the hydrogen on another. And this creates these weak hydrogen bonds that allows them to come together. And I apologize for any background noise, but I have my three-year-old in here and a puppy and they're making as much noise as they can sorry <laughs> okay so water is polar okay oxygen has its negative charge and hydrogen has its positive charge so that bit shape when you put multiple hydrogen and oxygen bonded water molecules together they tend to want to come together okay where the hydrogens off of one mo water molecule are attracted to the oxygen oxygens off of another and create this bonding okay so that allows this little guy or this little guy to hook up with these three other little guys and you get like a drop of water okay all coming together so hydrogen form bonds can also form between a water molecule and other polar molecules okay when that happens, you have a hydrophilic or water-loving atom and molecule pairing together with the water, okay? So things like salt and sugar are water-loving, okay? Because they actually will form a bond together, okay? And allow them to get dissolved. So if you put salt in water or sugar in water, it'll eventually dissolve. And they're both polar and they're coming together and breaking apart. So here's your table salt, NaCl, sodium chloride, coming in contact with each other, okay, and coming in contact with water, they're actually going to break apart. So the sodium actually gets separated away from the chlorine, and, you know, that's what happens when you add salt to water. It dissolves, and it becomes, you know, one big salty water mess. Okay, the opposite is true for molecules that are uh, water-fearing or don't like water. So those are called hydrophobic. So this would be any uncharged or non-polar molecule. These do not, do not dissolve in water, okay? Um, so they are going to have a hydrophobic reaction. So think of oil plus water. They don't mix, right? So oil is a non-polar compound, whereas water is a polar. So they don't mix. So water-fearing molecules like oil don't mix together. So this is a picture very similar to the video at the beginning of this lecture, talking about how your um, fatty acid uh, chains came in contact with each other. And so parts of them liked water and some parts didn't. Well, this right here would be where the water is, and this would be like where the oil part is. So if this was oil, okay, and then in here is your water, your H2O. Your water is like all just kind of like separated by itself in a drop, okay, and the oil's around it. So why do we care about water? Well, water's got a lot of cool stuff that happens with it that makes it 
uh, very important for us for life. Okay, it's very unique because of its structure. So we know it's small, we know it's got the bent shape, and we know it's polar, and that polarity makes it very um, adaptable for a lot of uses. So some of those are cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. So these are properties that are found in water that make it very useful. So cohesion, adhesion, and then also the fact that it's denser when it's a liquid than it is a solid, and it could absorb a large amount of energy. So let's talk about these. First of all, cohesion is the binding between like molecules. So water binds to itself through hydrogen bonding, and it has a high surface tension. So water comes together and it holds together, okay? And then there's adhesion, where you have binding between unlike molecules. So have you ever seen water dripping down glass or plastic? It's binding to that plastic into little droplets because it also is allowing a, a connection between unlike particles and water itself. And this results in capillary action and this thing called a meniscus. So you've seen a meniscus if you've ever uh, been in a lab and you've had to like measure out liquid in like say a graduated cylinder and it has like the little units here and you put water in it and you end up seeing this little dip here, okay? It's not straight across. That little thing there is called a meniscus and that's due to adhesion. So the water is actually clinging to the glass on the sides and it creates this look, okay, of a, a dipping, okay? So here's another way of looking at it. Here's a test tube, and you see that little dip there? That's the adhesion of the water clinging to the side of the glass, and it makes that illusion, okay? And then here's an example of water tension. Water molecules coming together creates enough tension for things like spiders to actually walk on the surface of water. So water is also denser as a liquid than as a solid. So most substances shrink as they solidify. Water actually expands when it freezes. And you know this if you've ever created ice uh, cubes in the freezer. If you put water in an ice tray, it's going to expand when it freezes and kind of come up over the ice tray. So it is denser as a liquid than as a solid. That's also why ice floats, okay, which is really important, okay? It's going to float and kind of create an insulating blanket on the surface of water. So here's a way of looking at it. Water molecules in ice actually have this big like open gaps here between them when they're frozen. But when they're liquid, they actually come really close together with smaller gaps. So that's why we say it's denser as a liquid. And so it's denser as a liquid and therefore ice floats, which is important because you know what would happen if ice didn't float? If you were talking about say a lake or an ocean, the ice would sink and it would kill all the little fishies floating in there because the ice would crush them and they would die. So we want ice to float and that's exactly what happens. Okay, water also has a high capacity for absorbing energy. Okay, it, it can absorb a large amount of energy. It has a high specific heat, which means the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water is by one degree Celsius. Okay, high specific heat. Um, many hydrogen bonds must be broken for the water molecules to move faster. Okay, so, you know, if you've ever sat and watched water boil on the stove, it takes a little while. It's not instant, okay? And that's good because if water didn't have a high specific heat, water would evaporate very quickly and we'd be in trouble. So luckily, you know, we live in El Paso and it gets very hot and it can get well into the hundreds. If water boiled at 100 degrees, we'd be in a lot of trouble because we wouldn't have any water because <laughs> it gets so hot here. So you want a high specific amount of heat. So that's good. There's also a lot uh, a heat of evaporation that is required. Water has a very high heat of vaporization. Okay, so it explains why sweating is effective for us. So when we sweat, we're actually water's accumulating on the surface of our skin, and that cools us off. So that's also something that's very important about water. 
Okay, water is also there for acids and bases. Uh, and you guys will learn more about acids and bases, but chemical reactions occur when substances are combined with another and broken down into other substances. Um, so one of those uh, ways of doing that is a chemical reaction. So you can have a reactant and that'll give us a product. So for example, H2O can be broken down into H plus OH. Okay, so this is a chemical reaction where water is actually broken down into its products. When water molecules disassociate into its own little hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion, so H and OH. Okay, you're actually going into what acids and bases are. Um, this is going to happen in both directions where a chemical equil equilibrium is formed. And since protons don't like to be by themselves, they're always going to create hydronium ions. So when you have two water molecules being disassociated away from each other, you're going to get a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion as a result. Acids are going to be the substances that give up the protons during these chemical reactions and raise the hydronium ions which is going to add an acid to the solution and make it acidic. And then bases are going to be the ones that acquire or take the protons and lower the hydronium ions, and that's going to make the solution into a base, so alkaline. You've probably heard of alkaline water that's real healthy for you, and I'm sure you've heard of acids, like acetic acid, which would be like vinegar. Okay, and here's some more chemistry. Um, you can actually look at the concentration of protons in a solution or in a molecule by looking at its molecular weight, which is the sum of all the atomic weights of all the atoms. And then here's a term here that's important for chemistry, a mole, one mole equals, and this is Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules this is the standard number that never changes. And so it's just a number that's been calculated based on lots of science and a lot of um, calculations and experiments. So this number never changes, and it's a number that's used when you're trying to calculate the concentration of a substance. So one mole equals this number here, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and it has a mass equal to the molecular weight expressed in grams. So the concentration of a substance in a solution is typically expressed as a molarity, Again, it's just the concentration of a substance, and it is the number of moles per liter of liquid. So the number of protons in a solution determines the acid-base reaction. And so there's a way of uh, actually doing this that's easier than counting them. <laughs> so you just come up with a number, 1 times 10 to the 7th, it's a scale, that represents the pH or the concentration of hydro hydroxide, uh, hydronium, sorry, molecules in a solution. So it's a negative base logarithmic scale of 10, and it's uh, got water right at the center as 7. So it is a scale of 1 to 14. 7 is in the middle, and that would be where water is, and that's neutral. Anything that's considered an acid actually has a pH of less than 7, and bases have a pH of greater than 7. So 1 to 7 is going to be your acids, and then beyond 7 to 14 are going to be your bases, also known as your alkaline solutions. Then you have buffers that actually protect against these extreme changes in pH because life us living organisms are very sensitive to pH. If you have too much acid, that's bad. And if you have too much base or alkaline, yeah. then that's bad. So we have buffers that are actually there to help maintain homeostasis and kind of keep things balanced. So here is a pH scale of some common uh, items that you might find. So again, right at the middle is water at seven being neutral. And then going down, this is gonna be your acids. <laughs> yeah. 
So some of your acids that you're going to be familiar with would be milk. <coughs> so that's a little bit more acidic than water. Urine, so pee, is going to also be acidic. And then you've got black coffee, tomatoes, wine, vinegar. Now we're starting to sound more acidic, right? Vinegar, lemon juice, and then ich, stomach acid, which is why you get heartburn or indigestion. And then at the opposite end, you've got your alkaline substances. So human blood is considered a little bit more alkaline than uh, water or urine. And then you've got seawater, so salt water, baking soda, Milk of magnesia is what you would take to balance out stomach acid. Um, ammonia and bleach and lye, those would be used for cleaning. Uh, so, you know, bleach, Clorox, if you're cleaning, you want a very alkaline because that breaks up and kills bacteria and stuff, and it's very, very alkaline, okay? So those are your two extremes of your uh, acids and bases. Okay, and then finally we've got carbon, which is a very versatile and very, very, very important element on Earth because it has four valence electrons and they love to form covalent bonds. And so it's a very versatile atom that can be shared and, and work with a lot of other atoms and molecules. Anything that contains uh, carbon is considered organic. So organic compounds are ones that contain carbon. So it's an almost limitless array. So there could be so many different shapes and combinations with carbon and other elements and single, double, and triple bonds uh, happening. So that carbon is really the center of life because so many things come from carbon. And so the carbon-carbon bonds were really what was crucial in that chemical evolution to lead to life. So here's an example of a set of carbons linked together with hydrogens to create octane, which is eight carbons and 18 hydrogens coming together. Uh, carbons can also form in a ring formation. So glucose, which is sugar, you can see it can form in a ring shape where you have uh, your carbons coming around here and then your hydrogens and oxygens bonding to it. So they could be chains, they could be rings, um, and they, those chains and rings can be multiple versions of them. Also important uh, to chemical evolution is the fact that there are functional groups that have hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur uh, found in them. And so these are your most important functional groups that we'll be talking about uh, throughout the semester. Amino groups, which are going to uh, attract protons and act as bases. And so amino groups, think of amino acids. Those are gonna lead to proteins, which make up ev almost everything about our bodies, okay? Carboxyl groups, which is gonna be uh, also acting as acids that are going to have carbon in them and oxygen. You've got carbonyl groups, hydroxyl groups, which is going to be your oxygen and hydrogen groups, phosphate groups, which we're going to find in DNA and RNA, and your sulfahydryl groups, which will also be found in like proteins. So all of these are important functional groups that we're going to be exposed to. Okay, and then finally, I'm just going to end with this table that you can look at in further detail, but it's just showing you the list of all those functional groups, uh, what is what they're made up of, some examples, and what they would look like, and how we would use them. So again, we're going to be getting more into detail of all of these different types of chemical examples uh, when we talk about proteins and fatty acids and DNA and RNA and carbohydrates and, and all the stuff that we eat. So in the next few chapters, we'll get into more detail of all of these so you guys can understand the importance of chemicals and the evolution of life. So thank you and we'll see you guys for chapter three.